appreciate you guys all being here this morning. I love thinking of you all as I'm prepping for a Sunday school class. Um, this is week 10 of our casket empty study. We are officially over the halfway point of the Old Testament, so good job. Um, I'm really thankful for you all uh, studying alongside of me. Uh, today we are going to be um, looking at some sensitive topics, including uh, sexual assault. So I just wanted to mention that in the outset of our lesson so that it's not a surprise for anyone here in person or listening online. Um, but where my prayer has been that we'd be able to look at these things through a restorative lens so that these um, verses that we share would be a encouragement, not um, a weight or a burden. We're going to see these things through the lens of how God sees them. And um, I hope that there's a lot of hope and redemption found in that. So let's go ahead and pray for our morning. Father, we thank you for this time. Thank you for the ability to come into your presence. We thank you for the opportunity to hear from you and your word. I thank you for the way that you've led me this week through this study, and I pray that you would uh, continue to use your word to speak to your people. Um, just pray for this time that it would be a blessing, and I pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So we remember that the theme of our casket empty study is that the Bible is one redemptive study through history with Jesus at the center. And the word I want to focus on this week um, is history, uh, because uh, we will be covering quite a bit of history uh, in, the, in this section. Um, and history is important because when we see how uh, history has gone on in the past, it helps us to understand the things that we're going through in the present. Um, even though I'm really, I'm not a history person, that is definitely not my favorite uh, subject in school. So, uh, but we can appreciate it together. Um, review from the last couple of weeks, we looked first at the creation section. Um, we saw the line of um, Adam, Seth, Noah, Shem. We went through Abraham and saw the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Uh, the last couple of weeks, we were looking at the 12 tribes of Israel during the Sinai period. And you'll notice that the line is turning blue. And that's a reminder uh, to us that God's promised king is coming through the genealogy and it's traced through that line. So today we are beginning the study of K kings. Uh, this was the section I was most hesitant to teach about because like I said, I'm not really a history buff. And there's also a lot of names in there that I can't pronounce. So, uh, but by the end of the next six weeks, uh, you and I will both have a better grasp on this time period. And um, we will understand a lot more about kings. Uh, I cannot guarantee that we will be able to pronounce names well, but we will do our best. Uh, we will fudge some of them, but most importantly, we're going to faithfully study this period of time in Israel's history. We're not going to be bogged down or intimidated by history and details and dates and times and names that we can't pronounce. Um, we don't want to avoid parts of the Bible because we, it makes us feel inadequate about our own knowledge. So we're going to charge on. And, um, and as much as learning names and things is important and how to pronounce them, if you must work on pronunciation for something, save it for the people you know in person, because these people are all dead and they are not going to be offended if you pronounce their name wrong. So it is okay, no pressure. Um, on our timeline, in our Old Testament timeline, um, you can see in the blue line, um, in, in the period of kings, we are going to see that this line shifts and it becomes two lines. And so today we're going to be talking about the United Kingdom um, in Israel. And the rest of the time we're going to be talking about how that line shifts into two uh, different stuff. And in the line, if you notice, this is a really cool thing. Um, the line becomes faded as it looks like 
the king is not coming. And, uh, but next spring, when we study the uh, empty portion in the New Testament, we will see that that line comes roaring back in blue um, as Jesus appears. Um, and we're also going to see a red crown. The blue crown is our um, like overarching icon image for this period of time. We're going to see a red crown that will be for illegitimate kings. So that's kind of a overview. So in this period, we're going to be studying um, from about 1050 BC, which is the date of Saul's inauguration to about the exile in 586 BC. So if you're following along in the study guide, we are on chapter four. Today we'll be discussing the first section of chapter four. And if you're ever confused in your workbook at the end of each lesson, it will give you the reading um, and where we are in, in, the, uh, in the study guide and on the timeline. So a little overview. Today we are going to be covering the first part of the United Monarchy, which will include Samuel, Saul, and David. Um, and next week we're going to learn about Solomon and the construction of the temple. And from there, we will take four weeks to discuss the northern and southern kingdoms. So we'll be covering 22 books of the Bible. Um, in six weeks. And so there, and those are also listed at the bottom of your timeline. So if you look under the period of Kings, you'll see all these books listed. Um, and the suggested readings are included in your um, workbook as well. So since we have a lot to do, let's get started. So flashback to the last lesson that I taught two weeks ago, we kind of talked about Joshua, Judges, Ruth. Well, at the end of Judges, um, I said that the theme of that book <clears throat> was the cycle of apostasy, that continual spiral down into disobedience um, and God's judgment. Uh, the last verse of Judges provides the succinct summary for um, that book. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So this foreshadows the need, the desire of the people to have a king. So we pick up in the next book, uh, which is 1 Samuel, and we're introduced to a woman named Hannah. She actually is... Um, the wife of a man who also has another wife. And the other wife is very fertile, has lots of babies. Hannah does not. She is the beloved wife of this man. Uh, similar, the echo back from Rachel's story um, and Rachel and Leah. So she is beloved yet barren um, and she is in competition. And this other wife is very uh, insistent on tormenting her about this fact, um, finds a lot of, um, pleasure in um, her sister wife's uh, pain. And Hannah would go to the yearly temple or, or the yearly um, feast at the tabernacle to celebrate, uh, but she just couldn't even celebrate. She did not, it said she cried and she wouldn't eat. Um, I don't know if you know how it feels to not want to eat when you are so sad, um, but that is how she was feeling. One year she went to the temple or the tabernacle complex and she wept so bitterly that the priest Eli thought she was drunk. Uh, and Eli rebuked her for drinking. Uh, she responded that she's not drunk. She's very sad. And uh, he says, you know, go in peace. May the Lord grant you your request. Uh, so Hannah does conceive and her son Samuel is born. Um, she dedicates him to the Lord's service. And after he's weaned, he lives at the tabernacle. And I love her um, prayer. This is something that I want to um, continue to think about. Let me find it here. The, um, the thing she says is, so, is just so beautiful. And I want it to be kind of a theme for our uh, lesson today. And where is it? She says, for the Lord is a God who knows, and by him deeds are weighed. Um, and that's in uh, 1 Samuel 2, verse 3. So as we look at all the things that happen, 
Something that we need to remember is the Bible is often descriptive, not prescriptive. So when we think about the things that the Bible says and talks about, it's not always uh, condoning those things as much as telling what is happening. And so from Hannah, we can see, but the Lord knows, the Lord sees, he is a God who sees us, and he is the one who weighs um, our deeds. So Eli is the priest at the time, and his sons are described as wicked. And it's pretty awful, the stuff that they are doing. They're taking the best part of the offerings for themselves. Uh, they are um, just wicked. And the Lord's anger burns against them. Um, and God calls Samuel, who is living at the uh, tabernacle, and uh, he is um, awakened in the night uh, with this call from the Lord. Um, he goes to Eli thinking it's Eli calling him and Eli tells him, go, go back, listen to the Lord. And the next day, um, Samuel relates to him that, um, God will bring judgment on the house of Eli. And so we see that happening, uh, shortly after, uh, tragedy strikes and the Philistines are um, defeating the Israelites. Uh, the Israelites were like, wow, we're, we're getting defeated. So let's bring in our uh, silver bullet here. Let's take the Ark of the Lord into battle with us. And that's like our magical talisman that is going to help us defeat these enemies. Well, the Ark gets captured. Uh, Eli's sons are killed in battle. Someone comes back and tells Eli about his sons. He drops dead, you know, when he finds out the ark has been captured. One of the son's wife uh, finds out that the ark has also been captured and her husband and all of these people are dead. She goes into labor, gives birth to a child and she dies. Um, and she names the child Ichabod, which means no glory. So the glory had gone out of Israel. And this, the magnitude of that is not something I, I think we can comprehend very well. But to, to the people of Israel, that is what set them apart. The glory of the Lord being with them. And to see that that was gone, I'm sure it was very... Uh, disorienting and disturbing. It was like that was their anchor that was holding them together and now it's gone and they are just really upset by that. So these events took place because God was judging his people, uh, just like we saw in the book of Judges. Uh, so Samuel exhorts the people, leave your idolatry, stop worshiping foreign gods. Uh, the people confess their sins, Samuel prays for them, and God answers their prayers, and, uh, and the Philistines are subdued. The ark comes back um, to Israel. The Philistines are getting sick and dying, and so they, they send it back, uh, and uh, that the, the ark stays there for, in, for 20 years. So, Samuel's sons proved to be as wicked as Eli's sons were, and they were not like their father. So Samuel is like the last judge of Israel. He um, is getting old, and the elders of the people see that, you know, this is not going to end up well. Uh, we don't want your sons to take over after you. Uh, they want a king. Um, but Samuel is really upset by that. They... Um, they say they want a human king. Uh, they want a king like the other nations. So at this point in the narrative, we are introduced to Saul. The people say they want a human king to fight their battles for them. They don't want to rely on the Lord. Uh, Samuel doesn't like the idea of this, but he prays and the Lord says, give them what they've asked for. And so he anoints Saul as king. And the name Saul actually meet the, is from the word that means to ask. So they literally are getting what they asked for. So it's important to note here that Saul is from the tribe of Benjamin, not from the tribe of Judah. So we saw in Genesis that the prophetic blessing on Jacob's sons the um, fourth son, Judah, was the one where God's king would come through. So it underscores at the beginning that Saul is not 
the prophesied king. He is not the one that um, is going to uh, be God's king. Saul does what the people wants. He leads them into battle and he defeats their enemies. But he does not do what God requires. He does not trust God or follow his instructions. Um, and there's three stories that really um, show that compellingly. So the first one is in 1 Samuel 13. We see that Saul and his army are fighting. They're supposed to wait for Samuel to come to um, do the consecrating sacrifices that are going to be uh, needed before they begin this, this next battle. But Samuel is late. Uh, he is seven days uh, late and they give up on Samuel actually coming and take matters into their own hands. And so Saul offers the uh, prescribed sacrifices. So he's, he's doing what God has said, but he is not doing it in the way that God has said to do it. Um, so Samuel arrives and Saul justifies himself, but you were late. Uh, but the armies were, you know, he has all of these reasons why what he did was actually okay. And God should be okay with that. Um, Samuel says, God doesn't want your sacrifices. God wants your obedience. So that is, um, that's the first story. Secondly, Saul disobeys God's direct command in uh, 1 Samuel 15. This is a presumptuous sin because he presumes that he knows better than what God has told him. This is, he is directly commanded when he goes into battle against the Amalekites that he wipe them all out. Um, he defeats them, but he allows the king to live and he keeps all of the best animals. So we saw in Judges that sometimes the Lord says to wipe this, wipe this place out. And sometimes he says, you can keep some of the spoils. Well, this was an area where the Amalekites, this was the Lord fulfilling his promise to Israel in saying, I will curse those who curse you. I will bless those who bless you. The Amalekites had not let Israel go through their land. And so this was the retribution for that cursing of Israel. So God was fulfilling his promises through the total destruction of this place. Um, and Saul said, but look at all these great animals. Uh, we can use these to sacrifice and offer to them to you. Um, so listen to the justification when Samuel calls him out. He says, but I did obey the Lord. I carried out the missions he gave me. I brought back King Agag, but I destroyed everyone else. Then my troops brought in the best of the livestock, uh, the best of the livestock to sacrifice to your God in Gilgal. He doesn't even say it's our God. He's talking to Samuel and says, your God should be happy with what I'm doing because I'm doing this for him. So we need to really be careful about how we respond when someone calls us out. Are we going to defend our actions? Are we going to um, diminish those things? Are we going to give excuses? Do we self-justify? Um, these are things that we see that's how Saul related to Samuel and the Lord in this. Samuel says it's better to obey than sacrifice and Saul acknowledges his sin. He says, I'm sorry, forgive me. But then he gives another excuse. I was afraid of the people and I did what they asked me to, but please forgive me and come back with me. And Samuel says, no, I'm not going to come back with you. And then Saul pleads some more. And finally, Samuel agrees to go back with him, but he says the kingdom is gonna to be torn from you because of this. Um, and it says that Saul worshiped the Lord, but even then he's not truly repentant because we see that it's Samuel that goes and fulfills the Lord's command to kill King Agag. Um, this story is contrasted with one just previous to this, which I thought was interesting as I was studying this week. In chapter 14, we see a story of, Josh, of uh, Jonathan, Saul's son. He is in battle and he is seeing that there's this outpost of Philistines that are, um, that he might be able to go up and conquer. And Jonathan says, 
uh, in 1 Samuel 14, 6, perhaps the Lord will help us for nothing can hinder the Lord. He can win a battle whether he has many warriors or only a few. Do you guys hear that trust? He's willing to put his life on the line, even though he doesn't have a direct command from the Lord. Saul had this direct command from the Lord and he wouldn't obey. Jonathan is saying, I know that the Lord can do it. I don't know if the Lord has said to do it, but I'm gonna step out in trust and obey and in faith go up and the Lord gives him victory. So Jonathan was willing to risk his life because he knew the Lord could do it, but even then he doesn't presume to know the will of God and understand how God will act. That reminds us of a story we'll see um, later on with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say, the Lord can save us, but even if he doesn't, we won't bow down to you. Um, so it indicates a real desire to trust the Lord. Um, and his hesitancy in saying perhaps is not based on his uh, la lack of faith in God's ability, but a lack of faith in his own ability. So that contrasts with Saul, who, who had the direct command, and yet he still did what he thought was best. So the third event takes place when Saul consults a spirit medium um, in Sam, 1 Samuel 28. He's about to fight the Philistines, but he's so afraid, uh, he wants to make contact with Samuel to see if he can find out what the Lord wants him to do. Um, and Samuel's dead at this point. And this was strictly against the Mosaic Covenant. Mediums and spiritists were not even supposed to be in uh, the country. And yet Saul goes to uh, this woman to find out what God wants him to do. You cannot use the world's methods to follow the Lord. You have to do things the, the way the Lord wants us to in order to be pleasing to him. So these three stories um, are an example of not just his disobedience, but his lack of faith and trust in the Lord. Um, for these things, Saul is rejected, and the next day he is killed, or he dies, he killed, commits suicide when he sees that it's not going to go well for him. So, now we backtrack a little bit, and we are going to contrast the life of David with the life of Saul and their kingships. So first of all, David is from the line of Judah. Um, and we are going to see that he is the chosen king. So after Saul's presumptuous sin in 1 Samuel 15, God told Sam, uh, yeah, did I say that right? Samuel, Saul, there are, there's lots of S's. So um, Sam, after Saul's presumptuous sin, Samuel goes and is told by the Lord to go anoint a new king from the sons of Jesse. And we met Jesse back in the book of Ruth, when we found out that he is the grandson of Boaz and Ruth. So Samuel goes to Jesse's house. All the sons are invited in. Samuel wrongly assumes that the tall, handsome, firstborn son of Jesse is going to be the king. But the Lord says, no, I look at the inside, not the outward appearance. I'm looking for the heart. Uh, David is like the original Cinderella story here uh, because they, he didn't even get invited to the party. Like he, they didn't even bring him, bother to bring him in. He's he's out tending the sheep. So of the eight brother, he of the eight brothers, he's finally called in at the end, and God confirms that David is the one that God has chosen. Samuel anoints him, and then we see several stories of David and Goliath. Um, it's a pretty familiar one, and David is brought into Saul's court, and that is after the battle where, um, where David is successful in battle, he uh, starts to be talked about by the ladies of the, the area, and they praise him, and they praise him over Saul. So Saul's narcissistic jealousy, he is just crazy that David would get any more praise than um, he does. And so he seeks to kill David. Uh, so David begins a life on the run. 
Um, and yet he spares Saul's life several times. Um, and this is an excellent example of, for us of how we can continue to um, trust the Lord when things over us seem like they are uh, not going the right way. So it's also important to bring out um, that this anointing happened in the town of Bethlehem. Um, we will see in later prophecies that this is where the Messiah is to be born. So after Saul dies, David is anointed king in Hebron over the house of Judah. Um, but at the same time, Ishbosheth is Saul's son, and he's crowned over um, king over the north. And he lives for, or he reigns for about two more years um, until he's murdered. And then at that point, the tribes come together and they recognize David as the chosen king. So this is where we get, you know, this term, the United Mar Monarchy. And this is where, um, it's actually kind of short-lived as far as, you know, kingdoms go, but they are united for this time. So um, David as king, he fights against the Jebusites and uh, claims the city of Jerusalem. And that is also called Zion. Uh, this is where uh, it becomes the capital of Israel. Uh, it becomes the holy city when the ark is brought in um, and retrieved. And there's lots of good stories about that as well. Um, so now that the ark is uh, the Lord is in Jerusalem, David realized he is chilling in his palace and that the ark of the Lord has no place to rest. Um, and he decides, I'm going to build a, a temple for the Lord's presence to dwell in. And he tells Nathan about it. And Nathan, the prophet, says, great idea. Go do whatever, you know, you're thinking about. And then hears from the Lord and says, actually, no, the Lord said a couple of things to me. Let me lay them out for you. Um, at this time, God makes several promises to David. Um, as with the Abrahamic and the Mosaic covenants, the Davidic covenant will be the framework for this period of time in um, and also fulfill some of the promises that we had seen before. The promises that God makes to David are similar to the promises that God has made to Abraham. They echo back to that. Um, and the reign of the Messiah will, will be a direct fulfillment of God's promises to David in this time. So what are they? David has told the Lord, I'll build you a house. And the Lord says back, no, I will build you a house. I will make you established and I will make your kingdom. Um, so God says, I will raise up your offspring after you and establish your kingdom. Um, he says he will build a house for his name and he will establish the throne of uh, David's kingdom forever. And this promise seems like it finds its fulfillment in Solomon who does go on to build the temple. Um, and although Solomon is a wise king early in his years, um, he does turn away from the Lord and to idols. So we learn about Davidic kings that some will seek God, some will not, some will follow God's laws, some will not. Um, and many of the Old Testament prophets will proclaim the rise of a coming king. Um, though God's people and kings were not faithful, God is the one who is faithful to bring his promise to fulfillment. So we see that Jesus is the son of David, um, and at his death, he was mocked as the king of the Jews. Um, yet he dies on the cross. God promised that he will raise up for himself his king. And so in Jesus's resurrection, God's fulfilling this promise to David that he will raise up the seed of David. So the resurrection means that God's promise is wonderfully fulfilled. Uh, the Davidic covenant also includes a promise that, the, that God will be a father to David's descendant. And so his descendant will be identified as, the, as, a son of, as God's son. So we've seen how the people of Israel have been identified as the son of God. Out of Egypt, I have called my son. Um, the people were called um, God's son. And so sonship language is used throughout the New Testament, um, specifically of Jesus. 
Um, and Hebrews takes this up to confirm that, God, that it's God's son that will reign on the throne forever over God's kingdom. God also promises that David's son will build the temple. And like I said, this finds its immediate uh, context fulfilled in Solomon, who does build a temple in Jerusalem. But here we see a caveat in this covenant. Um, God warns Solomon that his, he will fulfill his promise to David through Solomon if, God, if he walks in God's ways and keeps God's commandments. But if he or his sons do not follow God, then they will be cut off. And that's exactly what we see happening throughout the study of Kings. We're going to see, uh, and even our timeline has some great little things about like, did he follow God or did he not follow God? Did he follow God? Did he not? Um, and those help us to remember those things. God delays that judgment ultimately, but uh, the kingdom will fall and that temple that Solomon built will be destroyed. But the good news is that the New Testament reveals that God's desire to dwell with his people is not in a temple made with hands, but in the human beings that he has made who are being built up as a spiritual house through the indwelling of God's spirit. So we become the dwelling place of God. And it's just so beautiful. So Jeremiah speaks of the certainty of God's promises to David and compares it to the perpetuity of the day and the night. If you can break the covenant with the day and the night, you could break this covenant. But this covenant is not going to be broken. David will never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. Um, even though the kings, the human kings will be disciplined and punished for their sins, we read in Psalms 89, 30, if his children forsake my law and do not walk according to my rules, if they violate my statutes and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. But I will not remove from him my steadfast love or be false to my faithfulness. So God is fulfilling his part of this promise because the fulfillment of the covenant ultimately does not rely on the obedience of these kings, but on the obedience of Jesus. So from here, the narrative continues to show that what happens in the rest of David's reign um, and, God how, and, and how God pours out his grace on him despite David's sins. He has these wonderful promises and it seems like he kind of rests on those and he, he, it leads him into um, complacency. So for the next several chapters, we see that battles are being won, victories are happening. But it occurs to me that there's perhaps uh, this complacency, this resting kind of similar to the cycle of judges where there's a forgetting of God's uh, faithfulness. There is a... Um, you know, yeah, I think complacency is probably the best way to put it. So when his army is out, usually the king would go with his army, but he is decided he doesn't need to. Um, I think this is probably after many years of um, not listening to God's spirit. Um, David gets up from his midday nap. He's kind of a midday napper. Uh, nothing else to do, just hanging out at the palace while everybody else is doing uh, the wars and whatnot. And he takes a little walk on his roof. Uh, he spots a woman washing herself. He makes inquiries of his staff to find out who she is. And they tell him who she is. Um, and then he sends them to go take her from her home. David lays with her and she goes back home. Later, she sends word that she's pregnant. And if you saw that parenthetical note in um, verse four about her washing herself after her menstrual impurity, this is a little clue for us to realize it's definitely David's child. There's no other person that it could be at this point. Uh, she could not have been pregnant when she went to David um, by her husband because he's away fighting. So David understands that also. Uh, so he brings her husband home. And he hopes that he will go back home, have sex with his wife, absolve him of guilt. Yet it's, yet Uriah, this Sheba's wife, is too much a man of integrity to do that. So if he had sex with his wife, he'd actually be ritually impure 
and have to reconsecrate himself before he could go back and join the battle. Um, he doesn't want to do it because he respects the men that he's fighting with. He can't bear to think of himself enjoying the pleasures of home while people he also is, you know, brothers with are out fighting. So he stays the night in the courtyard. He won't go home. Next night, David gets him drunk and says, you know, go ahead, go back home. And still, yet yeah, Uriah persists in his integrity. I think these stories are really important um, for us to look at. Where has David fallen from? He had these beautiful promises, and yet this complacency, complacency this is not just like, uh, there's not really, you know, a lot of text that talks about this, but it's not that he just had like this hiccup and grace, like he, he just fell into this. There's had to have been, you know, you don't go from like being a man after God's own heart to committing adultery and murder in a turn of a page, even though that's what, you know, it looks like in our Bible. There's got to have been some time there that he was not um, following the Lord. So this pattern of David's sin directly reflects the pattern of the fall in Genesis Eve saw, she saw that it was um, pleasing to the eye. She desired, she took, and she hid. David saw Bathsheba. She re he recognized she was beautiful. He desired her, he took her, and then he hid. So the power dynamics in this narrative also need to be reflected on. So um, the text doesn't specify if Bathsheba was a willing participant in this affair. And I feel most times I have found this and heard this passage taught, it's assumed that Bathsheba was as guilty as he was. Um, even so far to implicate that she was washing herself on the roof to like draw in some wandering eyes. Um, yet how many other women in the Bible have been in this position, either forced, compelled, coerced? I think of Hagar, Abraham and Sarah's servant. What choice did she have? Uh, I think of Esther, a child taken from her home to spend a year in beauty treatments, getting ready for her one night to impress the king. This is not what a woman wants. So even Rahab, who commentaries really look down on her for being a prostitute, yet is it possible that she is like countless other trafficked women in our day, sold into slavery by her parents who needed to pay a debt or kidnapped and um, forced into prostitution. I think the best evidence for Bathsheba's innocence in this affair is the way that Nathan portrays her in his rebuke to David. So Nathan tells David a story. And at this point, I didn't realize this until I think I was reading this today. We find that Bathsheba, uh, Uriah is killed, Bathsheba is mourning for a little while, and then uh, she is brought into the palace and she gives birth to um, her child. We don't know how long that is. We don't know how, I always assume that this child was a newborn, um, but we really don't know exactly how old this child was. Um, this child could be um, older than, you know, however long. But, you know, when you're looking at the Bible, it's hard to see exactly the dates and stuff. We don't, we just see it move right to the next thing. And we're like, oh, it was like the next day. And it could be, you know, years in between. But even then you have nine months that David has been with this sin. He has been, you know, we know the Psalms that talk about how I tried to hide my sin and yet it ate me up. And this is where David has been for at least nine months. So Nathan comes to him and he tells the story of a rich man and a poor man and a little lamb. So the rich man has lots of lambs and has a guest coming. Um, and the poor man has one little pet lamb that he has loved um, from. Uh, and, and yet the rich man takes this poor man's lamb and serves it for his guest. So we know the rich man is David. We know the poor man is Uriah. Where is Bathsheba in this narrative? I think she's the, the little innocent lamb. She's taken, she's eaten, you know, she is served for the dinner. Um, and when power is abused, the vulnerable suffer. 
not only does Bathsheba lose her husband in this, she later on gives birth to this child and this child dies. So, but at this point, I just want to come back to what Hannah said. The Lord is a God who knows and by him deeds are weighed. So this is not forgotten. The Lord sees. It's not the end of Bathsheba's story. Eventually she will go on to be a mother to Solomon and he will eventually become king. Bathsheba is included in the lineage of Christ. So this is an important part of the story for us to look back at Saul. David is confronted with his sin and what does he do with it? It's true that David sinned, yet when he rebuked for it, he not only confessed his sin, he acknowledged his sin, but he grieved over his sin. God knows that we're going to sin, but it's what we do when we're called out on that that determines our legacy. Are we going to deflect it? Are we going to downplay it? Are we going to deny it? Or do we acknowledge our sin and grieve over it? Saul acknowledged his sin, but David grieved over his sin. And he found righteousness in God's um, faithfulness and not in his own merit. He truly repented. But <clears throat> because of David's sin, there are still consequences. So the Lord declares that he will cause David's own household to rebel against him. So next up in the narrative, we read that David's oldest son, Amnon, rapes his half-sister, Tamar. And there's no ambiguity in that passage. Uh, Tamar's full brother, Absalom, finds out, and he doesn't do anything yet. Perhaps he was waiting to see what his father, David, would do. David finds out, and he's really angry. Now, he does not do anything either. And I think it's important for us to see that we don't need to let our own guilt about our past keep us from calling others to account for their sin. So two years later, we, find, we see that Absalom kills his brother Amnon, and then he has to flee out of the country. He's out there for three years. David misses him, sort of, and brings him back in. And yet it's not a full reconciliation. Uh, it's not a full reconciliation. It's not uh, bringing back in as a son. Um, Absalom rebels and sets himself up as king. David now has to flee. All of this is such turmoil. And it all goes back to David's sin. And there are consequences. Uh, Absalom, his son, dies in battle. The civil war has broken out. Um, but David is reestablished as king. Then we see that David instructs his military commander to take a census. This is towards the end of David's life. Um, to find out the size of the army, Saul numbered his army as well in 1 Samuel 13. And we saw that that revealed that he had a lack of trust in the Lord and he was trusting in his own strength. Um, David is struck with guilt. At this point, he doesn't even have to have someone to come and tell him, you know, this is wrong. He, he realizes this is wrong. And he stops and he confesses his sin before God. Um, God announces the judgment on David and thousands of people die in a plague as a result. Uh, David pleads for the plague to stop, acknowledging that it's his sin that did this. Um, and these people were not the ones that sinned. Uh, the prophet Gad instructs him to build an offer, altar, so the plague would be held back. And it's built on a threshing floor that David buys. And this becomes the place where the temple is to be built. So this is the first sacrifice of the many that will happen in this location to save people from their sin, to um, bring them into that fellowship with the Lord, to allow that relationship. So what I really want to hammer home in this lesson is that while Saul acknowledged his sin, David really grieved over it and found righteousness in God's eyes, not based on his merit, um, but by faith and true repentance. 
So this is the end of David's life. Um, another one of his sons sets himself up as king and they have to say, no, it wasn't gonna be you, it's gonna be Solomon. Uh, so they anoint Solomon that very day and we will find out more about Solomon next week. Um, and so power is transferred in the United Mar Monarchy. So for the next couple of minutes, let's go ahead and have some time for discussion. Um, I had some discussion questions. We saw at the beginning of David's life, he was on the run because of Saul's jealousy. And yet those were years that really shaped his heart. Um, so what's one way adversity has shaped you? And um, maybe what was new for you in this lesson or what differences did you see in the life of Saul contrasted with the life of David? So let's go ahead and have some discussion and we'll come back for questions afterwards. All right, I'm back on with our Zoom folks. Thank you. I hope you guys um, were able to have some discussion. I'm having to pull on back our people in person. I try not to yell in your ear either so that they will be able to hear me. All right, so um, any questions or insights that you gleaned from your discussion time that you would like to share? Yeah, Paul. That's kind of like a blanket statement, but that is what's so beautiful that we do. Even in the person, it's the talking response. Right. So the comment for those watching online is that when we respond to adversity, it can bring a positive outcome. Um, so that in any way that we have an adversity in our life, depending on our response to it. Um, and I think. Yes, that is definitely important. I do think that um, as Christians, a lot of times we tend to think about how we need to respond to things. And we think about uh, just really taking a shortcut right to that response, um, that we don't allow ourselves the time to lament something painful that's happened in our life. Um, and I think that that is the vehicle through which we can find that God is faithful, that we don't have to... Um, that we don't have to just say, oh, well, it's all in the Lord's will, um, or, you know, well, God works everything to the good of those who love him. Like, yes, that is true, but it's okay for us to acknowledge this is painful, and this is really hard. And um, I think in that, we see how God is taking something and making it grow, that uh, this seed that's been planted in our life is dying, and that through that death, it is. Um, so if we just pretend like everything is fine, we won't get through that process um, as quickly. Other thoughts, comments? Yeah, Kim. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I was listening to a sermon by Keller, and he was talking about making a beautiful meal and decorating the table, and it's this amazing meal, and in an hour, that amazing meal is cold, mm. and in a day, that amazing meal is starting to fall apart, mm. and in a week, it's rotten and stinky, you know, and kind of this idea that David was going to be king. Mm. He was, this goal was going to be accomplished, but it's not like, okay, David, you're king, 
and you're good. Right. You know? Right. That it's like there's always something else. Yeah. You know, so celebrating those moments and achieving these, these goals and these good gifts from God, but not putting such a weight on them. Mm hmm All right. So summarizing, <sighs> there's a lot of good stuff in there. Um, David really waited for the Lord. He, he had the promise and yet he waited for the Lord to fulfill that. He didn't take it into his own hands like we've seen in some other Bible stories where, you know, uh, some people knew that there was a promise coming and so they made it happen. Um, and David did not finagle his way. He even had opportunities where other people were telling him, look, the Lord's delivered you into his hand. And yet he did not, um, he did not kill Saul. And I love that image that you shared of, um, bringing a meal together and, um, cooking a meal. And yet in an hour, if you place that out, that meal will be cold and will not be really enjoyable. And yet a day later, it will start to be rotten. And a week later, it will be, you don't even want to be there. So when the Lord has a timing for something, we need to wait for his timing. And that just shows a lot of David's faithfulness that even though he had been anointed, he waited for God to bring that timing. I think that's really great. Other thoughts, questions? Yeah, Deborah. Right, right. Yeah. And uh, so summarizing just the timing in the Bible, how it can look like we are turning the page and it may have been many years since then. Um, it's, it sometimes does not tell us exactly that. I think one of the best examples of that is I always think of um, Isaac as a little boy going with Abraham to the mountain because it's like right after, okay, Isaac's born. Okay, now you got to sacrifice him. Gee, he's just must be like five or six. But if you look back at the dating, he's actually more like 20. It's like, what does that picture look for us to see a grown individual being tied down by his father instead of a child that is, you know, five or six years old? So I, I do think that, you know, we have to read the Bible carefully um, and not especially let our picture of what we already have in our mind of what the story is. Because a lot of times we read these stories and we're given flannel graphs or we're given Bible story books. And so we have a picture of what it looks like and then we just read it and we don't kind of look. I just think reading comprehension is really important. So asking questions of the text, like what does this actually say? And then having to go back and say, okay, it says this, huh? It doesn't say this, this, and this that I've always thought. Um, so I do think that that's really important when we study the Bible. I think we're about out of time. Yeah, George. I think that the consequence, when you say turning those pages, the play is pretty consequential. Yeah. For sure. The, and that's, you know, the power dynamics when people in leadership take advantage of or, or sin, there are consequences for people. Um, we pray for our leaders to make good decisions, but, you know, our, a lot of times we have 
consequences that we can experience. We pray in our homes that our families will make good decisions, but oftentimes children have to pay the price for some of the decisions that we make. Um, so anytime there is leadership, it needs to be uh, done in a way that values the marginalized, the, you know, the quartet of the vulnerable, the people who would be most impacted by the decisions leadership makes. Bill, did you have yeah, something? I was going to say that uh, David was a less sinful than Saul. Right. But the difference is that when confronted, David was willing to repent, mm -hmm. the other one received correction, but Saul kept pushing it away, you know. And so I think that applies to our lives, my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the comment is that David is not less sinful than Saul, uh, but his response to his sin was different. And I think that's a direct result of God's choosing David, that he chose David and was from the promised line. Just like we look back in the other, um, you know, the stories of many siblings where, you know, I have set my favor on, um, shoot, now I'm going to, uh, Esau and Jacob, you know, I've set my favor on uh, Jacob, but not Esau. So it's really, you know, there is this God's choice. There is our response. And yes, those things are both true. And how do we see how that happens? You know, it's, it, we can't see on this side of heaven, how those perfectly uh, go together, but it is um, one piece. So well, I think that's all we have for today. So thank you guys so much for studying with me this week. Remember, um, next week we will have Sunday school. It will be our last Sunday school of the year. Um, from there, we'll take Christmas break and meet back up in the spring. So um, yeah, I'll pray because that's good to do. Thank you, Lord, for this time. Thank you for your word. I pray that you would continue to bless us as we go and worship. I pray that you have been preparing our hearts, softening us, helping us to be receptive to the work that you're doing in our lives. And I pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.